imagine yourself in a room. It is your shelter from the elements and from other dangers. There are no windows where trouble could sneak in. There is one door only, and that is festooned with locks of every kind. And you are thirsty, very thirsty. Your lips are parched and dry. You begin searching this very sparely furnished room for a drop to drink. It's a frantic search, but nothing. There's no tap, no bottles. And outside your shelter, you hear something that sounds like a stream. Yeah, it's definitely flowing water. And you search ever more desperately within your safe room. The shelter that you've created to protect and to save yourself is killing you. I want to talk about love. And everybody talks about love. We fall in love, we seek love, we make love, we are told to love our neighbor. We love toast with Marmite or not. Love is the only way to vanquish hate, the only way to create justice, the only way to build a heaven on earth. This I believe. God is love or so it's been said. And for many of us, whatever we mean by that complicated and difficult word, God, I think this simple phrase, God is love, rings very true. A longing for God seems almost indistinguishable from a longing for love. What do we seek? Complete acceptance, understanding, a source of hope, of faith, of joy. We all know that if we were to approach the world in a consistently loving way, that it would be a completely different world from the one we see around us. And I think we all know these things, and we go looking for love. We search high and low, as desperate to find love as if we were dying of thirst and searching for that cooling flow of water that we can hear but not see. And all too often, love manages to elude us. We get close, we almost reach it, but something goes wrong and it's only the tantalizing sound of love we experience, but not the quenching life sustaining coolness on our lips. I want to turn to a source that I've found wisdom in for many, many, many times before, born just over 800 years ago. The Sufi mystic poet Rumi left us words that continue to shed light on the challenges of life even now. And Rumi says, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. The walls that keep you from the life-sustaining flow of love are walls that you have created. You may have had help in the form of oppression and hurt, but they are yours. No one else has the power to dismantle them for you. The flow will not reach you unless you can. And it is not an easy task, or we would be floating in an ecstatic pool of love right now. Seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against love. What are those barriers? I think there are three. I've been taught that consultants always say there are three. And so there are three. Even if there were two, there are three. There are three. And there are three, although each one can grow from many sources and be composed of many different materials, 
pains, disappointments, wounds, and biases that we've gathered along our own journeys, the three barriers are, I'm not lovable, you're not lovable, and I'm afraid. I'm not lovable. It's probably the most important of all, because when we feel this way, we create every explanation why we should not reach out in love. But at the heart of all these seemingly sensible reasons for remaining protected is a basic sense that I'm not worth it. No one could love me if they knew me. Better not let that happen. At the very core of this Unitarian faith is the declaration that, that yes, yes, you are worth it. Every person has inherent worth and dignity. I don't care how horrible you have been at some point in the past, because we all have. You are not defined by the worst thing you've ever done. It doesn't matter that you've done wrong. It doesn't matter that you think you're not smart or beautiful or clever or funny. You are a part of all that is sacred. That alone makes you lovable if and only if you can let love in. The second barrier, you're not lovable. Well, we have plenty of reasons to find others unlovable. I mean, let's face it, not everyone in the world is as perfect as the people sitting in this room right now. No one is perfect except thee and me, and sometimes I worry about thee. And while some of our judgments are simply defensive, others are not to be ignored. Some people really are annoying. It's true. Some people are bossy. Some people have no sense of humor. Some go on and on about their own pet topic. Some people can be cruel. Some can seem to do nothing at all but complain. And I'm sorry, but we wouldn't be human if that did not also describe us to varying extents. All of the human flaws can be found right here among us to one extent or another. This community is not about finding perfect people, getting them in a room, and closing the door behind us. It's about being together with all of our flaws and helping the sacredness within to emerge and grow. And again, at the core of our faith is that understanding that within each of us is a heart of worth and dignity. There is a center to each one of us that is worthy of love. Loving does not mean putting up with bad behavior. Sometimes we have to love from afar because of what has happened to people that has made them dangerous or simply obnoxious. Loving does not mean overlooking that. It means believing, having faith that there is something more, some worth, some value that we will continue to seek despite the distracting appearance and actions. And finally, I'm afraid. And why would I not be afraid? As in our story about the shape of the perfect heart, every time we take the chance to love, we risk a piece of ourselves. We take the chance that love will be rejected and that we will end up with a gaping hole from experience, we build a set of biases that keep us from connecting with one kind of person or another. You probably have your list. Perhaps we should divide the world by class or race, or maybe it's people with short hair, people with tattoos, attractive people, tall people. I don't care for attractive or tall people. I know they will re reject me. It's guaranteed. 
And I can easily recognize this in myself, and I'm sure you can too, of various kinds. But perhaps more frightening still, even when our love is accepted, even when love is offered in return, loving changes us. We cannot remain the same once we have connected deeply with another heart, heard and seen life from a different perspective, felt the reality of another soul. Our hearts truly become different through this experience. A heart that has dared to love is changed forever. No one can promise that loving will be pain-free. We can only promise that the wondrous power of love cannot flow unless we do take that chance. Loving is not easy. It is not safe. It doesn't necessarily feel good. But loving is the way we must respond to a broken world, to our broken brothers and sisters, and to our own broken hearts. The sacred element of life is in your heart, and it is in mine. Our task is to break down the walls, to seek, and to find that glowing center in each and every person, and dare to love. May it be so.